I'm Cheryl Hentz, here on the stage of the Grand Opera House in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. The Grand has been part of Oshkosh's cultural tapestry since it was built in 1883. Through the decades, this iconic building has undergone many changes. We will examine those changes and hear about some of the Grand's most famous or infamous stories. In this segment, the Grand Oshkosh's director, Joseph Furlow, and I will revisit how the need to install a sprinkler system in the building at a cost of just under $300,000 turned into a project and a major renovation that cost more than $2 million. There was a truss repair that had been made at the Grand Opera House, then it was the Grand Opera House, back in the 1960s, and over time, that started to give way and um, it, it could have been a major disaster for this entire structure, um, which at that time, it was 127 years old, mm -hmm. is that right? And uh, apparently when there was a renovation done in the 1980s, they didn't catch that uh, truss issue. Um, so tell us about um, you know, how it came to be that when a major renovation was undertaken, back in 2009, this problem with one of the uh, trusses was discovered. You know, it's interesting because as we sit here today, we're coming out of this pandemic and the pretty brutal closing up of the arts. And folks will ask me how we survived it, how were we prepared for it, and I remind them that it's not the first time we were brutally closed for 18 months. Um, we were, um, everything you said was spot on. Um, the only addition to what I would say to you then is in, in deference to the, the folks who would have inspected the building. Also, after that, those repairs were done, bats of insulation were installed into the ceiling which obscured most of, uh, of, of what you're talking about. So it all started with the Grand Lounge. We, we were going to, we, the Opera House Foundation, now called the Grand Osh Oshkosh, we uh, had a vision to renovate a space in the building as uh, an audience hospitality center. And we raised the money, and the idea was that we would raise the money and we would give the space uh, to the city, to the building, uh, on behalf of the donors. And I raised about three quarters of a million dollars to renovate the Grand Lounge. In the course of that process, we installed a door, a single door between the, uh, the lounge and the balcony. And that triggered a code review. And the city uh, informed us at that point that you know, this, this building needed to be sprinklered. Now, it had, um, most of the historic buildings that were, uh, were restored in the 80s, most of the theaters, this is my third, um, sprinklers weren't trusted. So if you had this pretty renovation, you put sprinklers on the stage, you put sprinklers in the basement, but you didn't put sprinklers in the auditorium. The Grand was no different. We had sprinklers in certain areas. However, this code review said, Okay, you're gonna need sprinklers. My response, rather flippant, was, okay, it's your building, so put sprinklers in it, you know? And, 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 and I, I made a presentation to the council, city council, and we went back and forth on a little bit, and they obviously, uh, they did. They, 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 they budgeted the money to do that. Um, and I thought that was the end of it, obviously. And how much was just that going to cost? That was, let's see how, I, I, I will see how accurate my memory is. I would say $217,000 and change. For sprinklers, mm -hmm. okay. And um, so I thought we were done. And as they started to do the analysis for sprinklers, it was kind of like an onion. You know, the flag went up and thankfully, uh, Tom Carroll, the uh, engineer who, uh, who was contracted the city. Tom's pr pretty much the unsung hero as far as I'm concerned for this, this, this building. I was here and I was in the seat and that's great. But, uh, but Tom saw the issue and, and, and he, he, he gave me just enough of an alert 
that we started to think about what might happen. Um, and then they started inspecting. And what they discovered was that the trusses uh, at, at, the, at the base where they met the brick wall had deteriorated because somewhere in the 40s or 50s, the interior gutters had leaked. And you couldn't tell because the gutters on the sides of the Grand are covered. Okay. So uh, the, the wood had deteriorated to the point where the trusses had started to move. Not a lot, but enough. And um, as they started to slide down, the <laughs> roof trusses are connected to the floor joists. So the floor joists, which go this way, on the truss, they would nail a board, and then they would notch each board so that it would sit onto, uh, on, on, the tr on the truss. Well, as the truss started to move, they discovered that the, the joists were starting to, for lack of a better word, slip off their support. And that wasn't all. <laughs> the, in, in most historic theaters built after the 19, you know, 1900, if you were to go up into the ceiling where the plaster ceiling is, you'd see the, uh, you'd see the uh, a, a wire mesh hanging from the ceiling and the plaster was, was pushed up through. Right. This is 1883 we're talking about and that technology didn't exist. So much like old plaster walls attached to these trusses which were moving were lath and plaster. And as they uncovered that, the, the plaster you know, it shoots through it. They're called keys. I know all this now, where it squirts through and holds everything up. If we look up right now at the Grand, it, it, there's not much to see in terms of, uh, you know, it, in, in terms of if there were a structural defect. Mm -hmm. But when you really, really looked, there was a spot up here where, where the ceiling itself on one of these trusses had deflected almost 11 inches. And there was this little loop in the ceiling. And, and, and it, it had been there so long, people assumed, you know, there, was, there was no cracking, there was no whatever. It just kind of sagged. And people thought it was you know, one of William Waters' great designs, you know, except it didn't exist on the other side. But with no real problems, no one really thought twice about it. But, but on inspection, it was an 11 and a half inch uh, uh, gap. So then we went off and did a little research how people dealt with this stuff. And um, Tom called me in an office with, with, at the city. And they had done some research. And I think the theater was in Delaware. And there was a story about the, the, the issue that they had. And he showed me the pictures to take a look at that. And it was you know, the interior of the theater. And there was a tarp over the seats, like they were painting or whatever. Mm -hmm. and he said, no, no, go look closely. And it was the entire plaster ceiling had come, had down, come down in one sheet over the, over, like, uh, like, you know, uh, looking at current events right now, you know, uh, it's just, it, and thankfully the theater was empty at the time and no one was hurt. But I, I looked at him and he said, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. So we thought at that point that we were going to close for the weekend. Uh, I had, as, as, as luck would have it, I had a full house that night. This meeting was at 11 o'clock in the morning. I went back to the office and I, I and we, long story short, we, we took the show that would have been, that was, it had already played here, it was already set up. It was gonna go on at 7.30 that night. From 11 o'clock until that evening, we took it down, acquired Alberta Kimball Auditorium for the night, trucked the entire show across town, worked that, contacted the 600 people who were had tickets for that night and told them to show up at the other place a half hour afterwards because we had if people came here by mistake they needed time to get across town and opened the show and ran it that night half hour late and we sat down and I looked at the staff and I said okay tomorrow's show you know and we started all over again and what was supposed to be just a couple of days turned into 18 months yeah. um, because we just kept 
finding the problems. I think probably the first story precedes the, the, uh, the, the plaster stuff, you know, because that was what really condemned the building. Yeah. Did, did Tom Carroll or anyone ever express to you, Joe, um, you know, any kind of a possible timeline as to when something like that could just cave in? I mean, it's hard yeah, to say. there's really no way of knowing at what point the, you know, it took decades for the depression to happen. And obviously there had been signs because someone had fixed it in the 60s before and then covered it up and forgot about it. Um, could have been days, could have been months, could have been years. Yeah. But like you said, it wasn't a question of if, it was a question of when, it was gonna happen. So what started out is sprinklers approximately $270,000 worth, mm -hmm. ended up being um, two, almost $2 million. 2.1 something million, yep. yep. Yep, we used to call the, you know, because it really started with the Grand Lounge. So um, there are some people at the city who would call that furloughs $2 million bar. <laughs> 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 and they wouldn't be wrong. I know what's, what's interesting is it, uh, the, the ways to look at it is right. This 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 very innocent addition to the theater turned out to to be a two point whatever million dollar project, or you could say this very innocent thing uncovered a problem that could have been a disaster mm -hmm. somewhere down the road. This this was a major controversy in the mm -hmm. city because the, uh, clearly the city owns the building. Do they still own it? Today? Yes. Okay, so um, they own the building. You guys were leasing it from them. They're the ones who should be making the repairs, and yet they were members on the Common Council that did not want to do this. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know who started this, but someone started uh, an effort called Save the Grand. Stand with the Grand. Oh, stand, that's right. Stand, stand, with, stand, the with, the stand mm -hmm. with the Grand. Stand with the Grand, that's right. And um, I mean, t-shirts were made up, signs were made up, um, we had a theme song. Janet Planet sang it to the tune of Stand By Your Man. Stand really? with the grand, yep. Ah. She sang it outside City Hall the night of the, uh, of the, uh, yeah, of the, of the meeting. Yep. meeting. There were 53 speakers that night. Most of them spoke for five minutes. Um, by that time, um, a lot of the legwork had been done. You know, uh, but, but the, we didn't know where the vote would go. Two weeks prior, we would have lost that vote by, what, my, by my account. What was the difference in those two weeks? What happened? Well, I met uh, with, with every counselor um, and, and we, we talked. Um, there, was, there were other folks on our board who, who did some meetings. Um, a lot of people spoke. Uh, I'd like to think that meeting really swayed things. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were, um, even, the, even the folks who spoke in opposition weren't, negative. They just were opposed to spending the money. Um, I didn't intend to speak that night, but one of the three opposition points of view happened to be the last speaker. Uh, you know, a funny thing happened. In the structure of an Oshkosh City Council meeting, the citizens would speak, but then each councillor would have an opportunity to speak as they said what their vote would be. And um, one by one, they had stories. Uh, this one had been on stage at the Grand. This one was big on our educational programming. This one collected soup labels so that they could see movies for free uh, at the Grand. You know, this one had taken a, a face plant on stage. Um, I, 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 working my way around, but the, the point was nothing was negative and, and the, the votes tallied and um, we got to the end, we got to the mayor casting his last vote, and the mayor was the most vocal critic. Um, but he was also, um, for his opposition to the project, he was, he was easy to talk to. Mm -hmm. It was easy for me to have a conversation with him to try to put my point of view to, uh, welcoming it. So, he, so we ended up with a unanimous vote to repair the building. Um, and then it took another year from there. Uh, once we once we got started. So who came up with the um, actually stand with the grand concept? I love that question because 
Uh, it was it was a staff member um, who is no longer with us. Uh, she passed on years ago, um, and she had a she had a not a senior role on the staff, uh, but an important role on the staff. And um, in the course of this whole, and, but she's not an outspoken. She would she would not want to take over a conversation or certainly be in front of anyone. But one one day she just kind of said, "Stand with the grand." And it took off, and there and there it was. So I, uh, you know, um, I, I owe it to her. That was uh, I still have one of those signs in my office. How much uh, of an impact do you think um, the whole Stand with the Grand campaign, if you will, um, made in swaying the Common Council, uh, those members who were opposed to this? Um, how much of an impact was made by that whole campaign? I think it was enormous. I really do. Mm -hmm. um, I honestly, two weeks prior, I think the vote was two five, and against. And against. We stepped up. Actually, one of my uh, one of my good friends, um, uh, who had been a, a counselor and a mayor, uh, came up with the yard side concept, and we off we went with yard signs, and he helped me organize. Um, the uh, keep people organized. So all I really had to do was keep people civil. I remember in the parking lot that night, you know, here was Janet singing and here was all this, this it, it was one of the most peaceful uh, crowds on City Hall uh, uh, of ever, I think. Yeah. And, uh, and I remember telling them, you know, my only comment to them was, I, I felt at that point that these people knew what the right answer was, mm -hmm. and we just needed to make it easy for them. They're the heroes. Right. So 2.1 million thereabouts. Um, how much did the city kick in? Um, I'm assuming there was probably some grant money or mm -hmm. something, um, whether it be from the local historical society or the Wisconsin Historical Society. I, I don't know if they kicked Truth in. be told, I, I wrote a grant and I got $5,000. Five thousand. Five thousand. Um, I sat with um, our representative, Gordon Hintz, and Gordon found a way. You know, at that point, it was difficult for the state to give money because it was going to, you know, no one wanted to raise taxpayer dollars. Right. But he found a spot in the state budget where they could support us without impacting the tax levy. Hmm. I don't know, it was maybe a capital project or whatever at the state level. And, and they put a half a million in, the state did. Wow, okay. Um, the Grand pledged and only recently paid off a quarter million. So we had a, a, a just, just above three quarter of a million mm -hmm. came from sources other than the city. Okay. The remaining was, was, was city funding. Hmm. Okay. So besides the, the sprinklers, the um, ceiling trusses, um, what else needed to be done that was covered by that 2.1 something million? Well, somewhere in B footage or somewhere along the way, there's going to be a photograph of that ceiling. Mm -hmm. And I tell you that from wall to wall and front to back because of the plaster issue, that entire ceiling came down. And there was a point where in one of my photos, I was sitting on a truss. Because I'm not a heights person, but I felt like the community needed to know what was going on. Yeah. And I was sitting on a truss, suspended on the truss above nothing. <laughs> and um, so all of, all of that had to go. And then it had to be restored. And I remember vividly, I was up in the balcony talking to someone uh, when this whole thing went down. And I said, don't worry. We're going to put it back just the way it was or better. I'll see to it. And as soon as the words were out of my mouth, this little voice in the back of my head said, are you crazy? Do you know what you just said? But darned if we didn't. And, you know, often the, the city ends up looking a little villainous. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, once we got past the issue, the city of Oshkosh, the staff, and, 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 and they were heroes. Yeah. They, uh, our board allowed me to serve almost exclusively uh, as the city's liaison to the, to the contractors, um, and with the rest of my staff taking over other duties that, that I would do. Um, they, were, they were instrumental in, in finding the right restoration uh, uh, architects, the paintings, 
uh, are actually superior to what they were in the first restoration. And a lot of that has to do with uh, not only not only who we got to eventually do the work, but also the color scheme is a little bit more muted than it was early on. And that's that's largely because the city said, let's do this right. Let's get the research done and do it historically correct. If you looked at the theme before, you'd see almost imperceptible changes. Okay. The, uh, the, the artwork around the chandelier has been improved. Shakespeare's portrait, which is right above our heads right now, mm -hmm. uh, was greatly improved um, and, and colored. But, but the, the theme of the cherubs around the chandelier and the, uh, the, the plants along the walls, actually, if you pulled up an 1883 photo, you'd see exactly the same thing. Amazing. It's been the theme of the building straight up. Okay. So the renovation that was done, that should last how long into this? You know, the, the, the wooden trusses are now encased in steel. Oh, okay. Should last well beyond the time. We, and, and, and your photographs will show that. Okay.